Hello everybody. This is the first video in a three-part video series where we talk about the quality control tests on hardened concrete. When you make a concrete structure, it's important to know that that concrete's right, that it's gonna last, that it meets the specifications and the design that was required. To do that, it's very common to take hardened samples and then test them. That's the best way to measure stuff, right? To test them, see how it works, see what it's all about. There's a ton of different properties that we could be testing, but the two most common ones are strength and durability. Strength is by far the most common test method ever used to evaluate concrete. It's simple. And most contracts pay based on it. They won't give people money until the concrete reaches the strength that's desired. When you pay based on something, people figure out a way to get it right. Okay? When there's money on the line, that's when you, try it, you start to get performance. That's often why we almost always get strength out of our concrete. Okay? They go out of their way to make sure they do it right. But durability, that's a subject that is is as important as strength. Truly, I mean, it's great to have strong structures, but you want durable ones. You want ones that'll last a long time. But few people try and measure it. But this is changing as new test methods are being developed. We're going to talk about two durability-focused tests in addition to a strength test today that are being used by some people, but expect a lot of growth in this area as more and more people demand and ask for long lasting structures. People are working at finding ways to test for that and also give it to them. So let's get started looking at compression testing. So as I said before, compression testing is the most common quality control test on hardened concrete. Why? Because people pay for it, right? As in, the specifications don't pay people unless they get strength. Typically, we do these tests, at least in North America, on cylinders. And these cylinders have a one to two aspect ratio. It means if this dimension is D, that means this dimension is twice D. Sometimes it's a four inch diameter by eight inch height. Sometimes it's six inch, to six inch diameter by 12 inch height. And you don't have to make cylinders. Sometimes they'll make molds, plastic molds or steel molds. And they'll fill them up and they'll, they'll make them level and they'll wait till they harden and then they'll test them. But you don't have to do it that way. You can also take cores from a structure. That's usually the last resort because you really don't want to punch holes in a structure, right? You'd, it's much easier just to make the concrete cylinders as you're making the concrete structure. But sometimes that can happen. And that one to two ratio doesn't always occur when you're dealing with a core. But don't worry, there's modification factors used in the ASTM specifications that help you modify what the expect, with the strength you measure compared to the expected strength for a one to two uh, ratio sample. But in order to find the strength, we take a specimen, we put it in a hydraulic press, and we crush it. Pretty simple, right? Here's an example of what some of these setups look like. This one, for example, it's got a spherical head on the top. That means it's not a fixed head. That means this can move back and forth if it needs to. Then we have a steel ring, and then on, on um, between the steel ring and the concrete sample, we put something called a neoprene pad. This is like rubber. And we have a neoprene pad below, and we have another steel ring after that and this is where, where, where we load. So the loading may come like this, onto the structure, or onto the sample. We don't have to use neoprene pads, by the way. We can also use something called sulfur capping. The way sulfur capping works is you actually dip the concrete in molten sulfur to form um, a shape on the top and a shape on the bottom. This is really useful if the ends of your concrete aren't perfectly flat. If they're rough a little bit or off a little bit, you can sulfur cap them, get it lined up, and then start to load it. 
The neoprene is also very useful if the material is not flat. You need something between the concrete and the platen. I asked this question over here. Why do we use materials between the cylinder, the concrete cylinder, and the spherical head? Why don't we just put it exactly in there? Well, the reason why is if you zoom in on the surface of the concrete, even though you try to make it super flat, it won't be. It's going to be off a little bit. And so if you were to come down with this flat, this flat piece of metal on the surface to load it, you would actually get point loads at certain spots. Those point loads would cause premature crushing or premature failure of the surface where they might hold up for a while and all of a sudden you would boom, you would jolt, you would kind of do a shock load on your sample. You don't want that to happen. And that's why we use neoprene pads or sulfur capping between the concrete and the steel platen. Now, it's kind of crazy because if, if you ever watch this being loading, loaded, the, the amount of deflection that occurs in one of these samples is minimal. It's, it's less than an eighth of an inch is how much it moves before it fails. Pretty crazy, huh? When you're loading these things, theoretically, the failure load should look something like this. Theoretically, you should get a columnar or a splitting failure. This idea that as it's being loaded, that these areas would split down the length. Theoretically, that's what should happen, but it doesn't. When you're loading these, these uh, concrete cylinders, they typically fail like this or this, typically. As you're loading them, you'll, you'll see a small crack that'll occur in the center, and then that crack will extend, and then the sample fails. And once it fails, if, if you were to actually take a, a cylinder apart, if we were to look inside of it, there's actually a cone. A cone. That cone is that part of the concrete. Like, perfect cone that comes out. And this material on the side may explode. It may go all over the place. Okay? Or it may fail as, like, a separate pieces. This cone may just fail a at the bottom. It's also possible to get something called a shear failure. What a shear failure is, is that instead of failing like, like this, actually the, the sample fails something like that. A part of it breaks off. It may not go halfway. It may go deeper than that. That's called a shear failure. And there's a lot of people that think that this isn't a valid or as valid of a failure mode as the other two. While it's still accepted by the ASTM, this one of these two is this failure mode that we're shooting for or looking for. So why does this happen? Why does this kind of strange shape happen? Well, in the current ASTM method, the end caps, that's the metal caps on the top and the bottom. And the load platen, they help restrain the cylinder. They help hold it back at the top. So one typically gets this cone-shaped failure. What am I talking about? I mean that even though we're applying load like this, that there still is load applied from the sides, or there's still restraint, as in the concrete can't bow out at those locations. So because of that, the deflected shape looks something like this. It's restrained or held at the top and held at the bottom. And this is called barreling because it looks like a barrel. But what happens is that as you're loading, this load kind of spreads through the sample and then spreads back out. And that causes a tension force in the center. And that's why we see the crack forming right about the center of the sample. I've tried to draw this again over here. This tension is going to dictate the failure mode. This idea, this is a compression area and a compression area, compression, compression, and this tension is going to dictate the failure mode. And again, that's why the cracks occur as they do. And one thing that's pretty interesting is that the load rate during this test, 
is really important. If you load a sample really, really quickly, then the crack distribution is going to be different than if it's loaded at a slower rate. People don't really know why. There's a lot of arguments on why this happens. But there's a lot of examples where things that are loaded very, very rapidly, like um, by explosions or like impact loads, have higher strength than, or higher stiffness as well than those that are loaded at a much, much slower rate. So because of this, because the values vary based on how it's being loaded, it just is controlled. And these samples should be loaded between 20 and 50 PSI per minute. Now there's many automated compression machines these days. That means these are machines that are programmed to load at this rate, no matter what. They're pretty cool and they're useful to help reduce the variability in the test method. Another thing that's important is the moisture content. What? Why would moisture content have anything to do with strength? But it does. Cylinders in this test are supposed to be moist, but not saturated. Why is that? Let me explain. If I've got a um, sample here that let's just say is dry, very, very dry, and I have a sample here that's saturated, or close to saturated, how's that? Approximately saturated, just below saturation. And then I have one that's in the middle. It's not saturated, it's not dry, it's, uh, we'll just say moist. And if I was to draw where the water is, this is water all inside the pores. Now, how would this ever happen? Well, you would keep the sample in the fog room, or you'd keep it in a bucket of water, some kind of idea like that. And this sample that's dry, there's no water anywhere, but there's cracks inside of it. Why would there be cracks? Well, when you dry a sample out, you get micro cracking. It loses water inside the pores. The concrete shrinks, causes damage. And when a sample is moist, that means not saturated, not dry. It may be moist, it may be saturated in the center, but it may be dry on the outside. At least that's what happens when you quickly dry a cylinder. When you take a cylinder out, you wipe it off, and you dry it. Maybe you do a hair dryer on the outside, or you do some other trick like that, where you're just drying the surface, because that's what happens, right? You just dry the surface. And believe it or not, when you run this test, if, if you were to run compression tests on all the same concrete, but you treated them, the cylinders differently in these three different manners, you would find this would be the weakest. And you would actually find that this one is the strongest. Isn't that crazy? And this one is the middle. Wow. Well, first let's, let's explain why does that happen? Well, when you dry this one, and maybe it's not this far, maybe there's a little bit more moisture on the outside. Maybe it's, it looks more, more like this, okay? Maybe it's not quite as dry as I was showing it before. Maybe it's something like this. When you do that, this outer layer of concrete shrinks. And when it shrinks, it's going to pre-compress the inner core. It's going to ac actually make it stronger. Pretty crazy, huh? And this one, when it's saturated everywhere, okay, it's uniform. There's no, there's no pre-compression just uniform and it's going to break in the middle so you might say well why would we want the one that breaks in the middle wouldn't we want the strongest one well when you're running tests you want the most consistent one you want the one that's the easiest to get to and if i took a, a cylinder out of a water bath or a fog room that's a place where it rains 
and I just dried the outside of it and I tested it, that's pretty simple. And that's pretty consistent. And that's exactly what we want in this test. So those people that want to cheat, if you want to get a little bit more strength out of your cylinders, you can by letting them dry around just the outside. And if you want to make sure your cylinders are right, you could leave them in a bucket of water until it's right before it's time to test them. You take them out, you dry them off of the towel, put them in the machine, start going. So I've got a few other questions at the bottom. Do the molds make a difference? The molds. I mean, this is the thing outside the concrete that holds it in place. Does a plastic mold, does it make a difference compared to a steel mold? Well, if your molds aren't straight, if your molds are deformed or not quite right, it can have a big impact on your strength. If you're already deforming your concrete in that barrel shape before you start, it's going to take less to cause it to fail. Steel molds are known to give you more strength than plastic molds. They're just expensive to clean and get right. Do the results change in, in your test if you drop a cylinder? Yeah, definitely. What happens if you have to really beat on the cylinder to get it out of the mold? That's really bad practice. Shouldn't be done, especially with early age concrete because you're gonna micro crack it. This is not, this is a, not just anything. This is a specimen in a test method. We've gotta start thinking about it that way. Gotta start treating it that way. It's important and everything you do can change the results. So you need to be very, very consistent in the temperature you store it in, the moisture condition you store it in, how you dry it before you test it, the way you test it, again, it's all about being extremely consistent. Thanks.